quality of the sermon this morning. But I guarantee there's something for everybody. I invite you to pray with me one more time before we get into this word. Dear Lord, my thoughts are all over the place. And yet, my heart is right here. So I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. The road less traveled, living on the edge. The idea of the theme is not only talking about being different. It's not only talking about being the kind of person that does what everybody else is not doing. But for me, it has also been a journey into Bible verses I normally don't preach on. Last week was an example. We spoke about a man called Benaiah who killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. And a lot of people came to me after the service and said, we have never come across that verse. In fact, they started checking to see if it actually existed. So this is a journey of discovery in God's word but at the same time, it's also intended to make sure that you get something you can live with. The first message, the theme was, he asked for what? Caleb asked for a mountain. The second sermon, he did what? That was about Ben killing a lion. This morning, the sermon title is, he dropped what? You can tell a preacher's getting lazy when he starts giving sermon titles that are questions. But you understand, I'm trying to prepare you for what's coming in the text. So let's get right into it and read the verse. Today we are in 2 Kings chapter 6, reading from verse number 1 to verse number 7. Before we read the text, you must know the difference between Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is the man that is responsible for shutting heaven for three and a half years because he prayed. Elijah is the man responsible for the death of over 450 false prophets of Baal. Elijah is the man that ran away from Jezebel and God called back. It was Elijah who passed on his ministry and mantle to Elisha, his prodigy. And when Elisha asked for a blessing, he said to Elijah, give me a double portion of your gift. Now something interesting I discovered while reading is that Elijah performed 16 miracles. I would go through them, but I don't want to bore you. Before he died, Elisha performed 31. So Elijah performed 16, Elisha performs 31. Somebody is saying, but pastor, that's one less, a double portion. Well, the Bible says that when Elisha died and his body was in a cave, some men were running away from thieves, threw the corpse into that cave, and the moment it touched his body, it came to life again. So that covers it, 32. So he received a double portion of the blessing, and yet Elisha, in my opinion, was more peaceful than Elijah. In fact, the most conflict that Elisha got into was with a bunch of kids, and he got a she-bear to beat them. That's another sermon for another day. One of the things that the prophets would do is they would train other young men to also take over the mantle. They were called the schools of the prophets. Samuel started it, Elijah, Elijah continued it, and now Elisha takes over. So by the time we get to 2 Kings chapter 6, verse number 1, Elisha is in charge of the school of the prophets. If you're with me so far, let me say yes. Only one person said yes, so let me repeat everything again. Elisha is the leader of the school of the prophets. And what has happened during his time is that the number of students has grown exponentially. More young men have come because they recognize that Elisha is a called man and they want to be a part of what he does. One day, probably during class or during break time or fellowship break, whatever it was, 
the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, as you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. So uh, they, they, they had this uh, location where they would meet and Elisha would teach them and counsel them and guide them. And so a group of them came and they said to Elisha, it seems that this place is now too small. We need something bigger. And I can testify with the head deacon of this church, this place is becoming too small. I think we need something bigger. Amen? That, that, that was a hint to the ministry comedy. The prophets recognize that the place is too small and so they want something bigger. I, I want to pause right now and just make a point that is relevant. New growth brings new obligations. New growth brings new obligations. What that simply means is you want to grow, understand that you might have to be responsible for something. You want to grow, you might have to change something. You might have to change your location. You might have to change your job. You might have to change your friends. You might have to change your studies. You might have to change your ideals. Something's got to give in order for you to grow. Or if you don't, you will be like that fish that has been crammed up in that bowl. And so the student said, it's time for us to grow. The place is too small. Unless you do something beyond what you've already mastered, you will never grow. Nobody can say, I want to be a better preacher, and yet you don't master the art of preaching. Nobody can say, I want to be a better doctor, but you don't advance in your studies. Nobody can say, I want to be a better accountant, unless you learn new software and new methods. You have to master something beyond what you can do. And so those students said, this place is too small. We need something bigger. And so Elisha responds and he says, uh, they say to him, let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. It seems that Elisha understands that there's a need for a bigger place. Elisha understands that in order to grow, the place has to expand so that the students can expand. More space, more students. Right now, I'm looking at the room, and there's a couple of us who were students in AUP. And all those who studied in AUP know a dorm called Mulave. Some of you had the unfortunate privilege, gentlemen, of staying in that dorm. You had eight dudes on one side, eight dudes on the other, and in between was one toilet and one shower, and they had to share it. So that's 16 dudes sharing one toilet. Space means something. Growth means something. Next thought. The prophet said to Elisha, please come with us. Someone suggested, I will, he said. So he went with them. I know you're looking at this text and thinking, this has to be the most simplest passage ever. It's basic conversation between Elisha and his students. But I want you to go just a little bit below the surface. These men could have said to Elisha, this place is too small. We want to go to somewhere else which is bigger with a new teacher. They could have said to him, what you're offering us is not enough anymore. We want something different. But they said to him, no, you should come with us. It wasn't about the man. It was about the God that he served that made them want him around. See, they knew that Elisha was a man of God. They saw what he did. They saw his character. When Naaman offered him money, Elisha said no. They understood that he had integrity. He had honesty. He was a man who was focused on the calling that God had given him. And so they wanted to keep him around, not because they liked him, but because they liked the gift that he had. And so they said, please, come with us. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. Now, now we can get into the message for this moment. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. These men did not ask for a marble building. They did not ask for a concrete building. They did not ask Elisha to build it for them. They decided they were going to cut down trees and build a new place themselves. 
What made cutting down the trees possible was their willingness to do it and then the axes in their hand. Sounds simple, but follow my thought. It's not enough to desire to do something, you have to actually do it. It's not enough to say, I want to cut down a tree, and then you don't have the axe head. It's not enough to say, I want to cut down a tree, but you got nothing in your hand. You can stand in front of the tree and shout at it, it will never fall down. You can stand in front of that tree and preach until you're foaming in the mouth. That tree will still be standing by the time you're done. You can pray and pray and pray. That tree ain't going nowhere. You can get people together and sing hymns or praise and worship music. Whatever it is, that tree will remain standing. In fact, what you need is cutting edge faith. Cutting edge faith. And here, here's the thought. Here is the thought. I came across a word this week while studying. And that expression or phrase is cutting edge. When somebody says that something is cutting edge, it means that it is so advanced, it goes beyond its time. For example, if you look up at the screen, there's a lady with her hands up. She's sitting in a car that's driving itself. That's cutting edge. Or maybe you can see the lady looking in the screen. There, there's uh, 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 Alipay options in China where you can go to a takeaway. You don't have to use money or your phone. You actually get your facial scan and you can pay for stuff like that. That's awesome. Or maybe it's the new Apple Park or center that they have. And so those things are cutting edge. And well, the fashion is not really cutting edge. I know nothing about women's clothing, but that's cutting edge to me. Cutting edge simply means it's beyond its time. It is so advanced that it is beyond its time. And that's the kind of faith that God wants us to have. How does your faith become stronger? Cutting edge faith is sharpened by the experiences God allows in your life. If you want cutting edge kind of faith, you have to accept the challenges that come in your life. The things that go wrong, the, the mountains you have to climb, the valleys you've got to live in, the deep end you've got to swim in. Those are the things that God allows in your life in order for you to have cutting edge faith. Cutting edge faith simply means that most people have a faith that is blunt. It can't cut anything. It has no effect. It, it does nothing. But cutting edge faith, when it cuts down a tree, it produces results. But unfortunately, the story takes a turn in verse 5, and it says that while one of them was cutting a tree, the axe head fell into the river. While he was cutting the tree, the axe head fell into the river. Here's the thing. Many of you lose your faith, lose your axe head in the river of life. For whatever reason, for whatever way, you lose the faith that God has given you at the beginning of your journey. And the amazing thing is that this young man lost the axe head while he was with the other group. While he was working, while he was part of a project, while he was part of the exercise of building a new school, a new dormitory. He lost his axe head. Now I want you to know, he could have pretended like it didn't happen. He could have continued being part of the group without an axe head. But I want you to notice that he goes through a process of recovering his axe head again. And from that experience of receiving back his axe head, I want you to notice the steps that he takes and what you can do. And then after that, we will pray and go ahead and have potluck. One more time. Many have lost their axe head. They've lost their faith in the rivers of life. Maybe uh, finances were not so good. Maybe relationships broke down. Maybe uh, the church wasn't the way you wanted it to be. Maybe your family fell apart. Maybe you got sick. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe different things happen in your life that chip away at your faith. And eventually, you lose it. You lose it so much that you sit in a service Sabbath after Sabbath, Sunday after Sunday, Tuesday after Tuesday, Wednesday, you come and yet no faith, no effect, no experience. 
You are like an axe with no head. You're just a stick that does nothing. Sits there and wonders what's going on. But there's a way you can recover your faith. And I want to share that with you today. First things first, it is important to take responsibility. It is important to take responsibility. Turn to your neighbor and say to them, take responsibility. Take responsibility. Now, now, taking responsibility can mean different things. First of all, for this young man, he took responsibility by admitting that he lost the axe head. He could have pretended like nothing happened. He could have pretended like he was okay. He could have hidden behind a tree, waited until the day was over, and found another axe head. But here it is, that the experience he's going through, he accepts, I have lost my axe head. He was still part of the group. He was still part of the school. He hadn't been kicked out. He was still there. But he lost his axe head. He took responsibility. Why did he take responsibility? He took responsibility because that axe had been borrowed. It wasn't his. It was a borrowed axe. Now someone is thinking, why didn't he just go to the hardware store and get another one? Now understand, it, it, it may be cheap today to get an axe head, but it, it wasn't then. Iron was expensive. It was very difficult to replace. And so this young man is concerned because he lost something that didn't belong to him. He's just a prophet. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have credit. He's got nothing. And he just lost the one thing he had borrowed. Listen to this. Faith in many ways is borrowed, whether from God or from those around you. Let me explain. Faith doesn't come because of what you do. Faith doesn't come from your willpower. Faith comes from God. God is the one that gives us faith. As, as that young man borrowed the axe head, we also borrow faith in order to use it to serve God, to live, to function, and to exist. And so he lost that which God had given him. And many of you are not bothered by losing your faith because you don't realize where faith comes from. But also, faith can be borrowed from the people around you. The Bible says in uh, the book of 1 Timothy, Paul says to the young man that your faith came from your mother and from your grandmother. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, again, the writer says, We have a cloud of witnesses. Therefore, let us run the race and put off every weight. He is basically saying all those people in Hebrews chapter 11, all those men and women who are described as living by faith, they have passed on the baton of faith to you and me, and now they are watching to see what are we going to do with that faith. I don't know whether it's the microphone or my suit that's making me sweat like a dog. Faith in many ways is borrowed whether from God or from those around you. I want you to understand that it was because of somebody's faith that you ended up in this place. Very few of us can say, I ended up a Christian because of my own effort. Somebody spoke to you. Somebody preached. Somebody sang a song. Somebody encouraged you. Somebody sent a text. Somebody sent an email. Somebody did something to bring you to the Lord. All of us borrow faith from somewhere. If it's true, let me hear you say amen. Faith is borrowed. Every time you listen to a sermon, you are borrowing my words to affect your life. But at the end of the day, faith doesn't come from men. It comes from God. It comes from God. I can preach all I want, and if the Spirit does nothing with that sermon, you will leave this place no better than when you came in. So as I borrow from God, I give to you. And as you borrow from God, you pass it on. But this young man lost it. But he was responsible enough to say, I lost it. The second thing you can do to recover your cutting edge faith is take time to remember. Take time to remember. What, what, what is it that he needs to remember? Verse 6, Elisha says to him, where did it fall? Where did it fall? Now, I want you to understand something. Take a few steps back. 
They are cutting trees next to the Jordan River. Of all the rivers on the planet, the Jordan River tends to be the most muddiest, dirtiest river at many seasons of the year. And so when that axe head fell in, it's not as if you could look inside and see where it is. And also, the Jordan River spills over into the Dead Sea. So it is possible that at that spot where they were, the current could have taken that axe head and dragged it on the ground and moved it to another place. But Elisha says to the young man, where did it fall? And what he had to do was remember the spot where it fell and show the prophet it fell right here. What does that mean? You lost your faith. Do you remember why it happened? Do you remember how it happened? Do you remember what you were doing? Do you remember the lifestyle that you adopted? Do you remember the people you were associated with? Do you remember what you gave up? Do you remember how you fell out of love with God? Do you remember the day, the time? Are you aware of what happened? Sometimes it's good to take a step back and relive how you got lost. It's good to relive the experiences of yesterday. Because if you can remember yesterday, you will know where to begin. But make sure you don't get lost in yesterday. Some people get so caught up with yesterday that they never get their faith back. Their axe head never comes back because they are stuck in the same place. But the young man said, it fell right there. Notice he is also remembering that he can't do it by himself. He needs help. And so he goes to Elisha and says to him, sir, I borrowed it. In other words, please help me get it back. Where did it fall? The man of God asked. He showed him the place. Elisha never said, what were you doing? How did you drop it? Why why did you drop it? Do you know how expensive an axe head is? Elisha didn't lecture him. He simply asked him one question. Where did it fall? And you and I, brothers and sisters, have that role of asking people a lot of questions and we never ask the right one. We ask them a lot of things that have got nothing to do with anything regarding their fall. And that's why people never come back. But Elisha said, tell me, where did it fall? I'll help you get it back. Number three, recovering cutting edge faith. Take the remedy. Take the remedy. What does that mean? Look at the text. In verse six, it says that Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot. Pause. It's the Jordan River. It's probably close to the place where Jericho is because that's where the school of the prophets ended up at some point. It's not shallow enough for you to put a stick in the hole of the axe head and pull it out. That's not what what he did. He broke a stick off a tree and threw it by the spot and then waited. I can imagine that student is standing there watching Elisha do something that seems incredibly dumb, throwing a stick into the water, and yet he wanted something out of the water. He didn't ask him to jump inside to get it. He didn't ask him to jump and swim and try to dig for it. No, he simply said, show me where it is, and he took a stick and threw it inside the water. Sometimes we have to accept the methods of God to bring us back to a good relationship with Him. Sometimes the things that God does to bring people back into the fold don't make sense to us. We try to preach to them. We try to sing to them. We try to do Bible studies and nothing is happening. But God says, what you need is a stick. The stick, in my opinion, in my thinking, it represents a solution not in the water. See, the water was dirty. The water couldn't help him. But they needed something from outside to go in. And that's why we need the cross of Jesus to come in so that we can be saved. Because without Christ, we are nothing. Without his blood, without his love, we can keep running around, but we'll never get the faith back. But with the cross of Jesus, it can happen. Would somebody say amen? The stick was not made by the prophet. It wasn't made by the student. That stick was made by God, but he simply broke it off, threw it inside. Then the axe head floated to the surface. A stick was thrown into deep water that was dirty, 
and the axe head floated to the surface. How does God come up with these ideas? Sometimes I think God is just trying to show off. Sometimes I think God is sitting in heaven thinking, how can I blow their minds today? He throws a stick in the water and the axe head flows to the surface. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Notice, at some point in the process, God takes full control. Yes, Elijah could, Elisha could ask the question. Yes, Elisha could throw the stick inside. But at the end of the day, he had to let God take control. Sometimes we forget in the process of getting our faith back, in the process of getting that cutting edge experience back, we forget that it's not me, it's not you. It is God who has to do something. All you can do is apply the cross, but at the end of the day, it's God who has to do something. God takes control, and the axe head comes to the surface. And then finally, take it right back again. Take it right back again. Grab it, Elisha said. And the man reached out and grabbed it. See, when Elisha threw the stick in, he could have seen the axe had come up. Elisha could have taken it himself and then handed it to the young man. But instead, Elisha said to him, you go ahead and get it yourself. Because someone else can bring you to it. You have to reach out and grab it yourself. This sermon is the stick in the water. The song that the young lady just sang is a stick in the water. All those emails and messages and posts that talk about Jesus, all those sermons that you listen to, all those devotionals in your family, that's the stick being thrown in the water. But at some point, you have to reach out in your effort and grab it so that the axe head comes into your hand. Well, what is it that has caused you to lose your faith this morning? What journey have you taken that has robbed you of your faith in the Lord? The Bible says that the young man reached out and grabbed it, and that's the end of the story. We, we don't hear anything else. The, the passage next just switches over to another experience altogether. What, what do you think happened? What do you think happened? I'm asking a question. What do you think happened after he got the axe head back? What do you think happened? Are, are, are you thinking? What do you think happened? He went back to cutting trees. He went right back to cutting trees. He didn't go from village to village showing them this axe head that floated. He never went to his friends and said, hey, look what the prophet can do. Throw it back in the water. No, he went right back to cutting trees. God's interventions are not intended to cause distraction, but rather to foster determination. Do you know why God delivers you? Do you know why God gives you faith in the first place? Do you know why God does amazing things in your life? Not so that you get stuck on what he did, but so that you can continue to do what you do. So when God delivers you, when God comes through, when God steps up and does what he does, your assignment is not to get stuck thinking, wow, look at what God did. No. Go back and complete the assignment. The axe head was redeemed with a stick. You were redeemed with a cross. If ever you've come to the place where you lose your faith, go back to where you dropped it. If you can't remember, go back to the cross. The prophet of the Lord says every day, every day, start your day at the foot of the cross. Because if you can start at the cross, it's a good place to take that road less traveled. Many people keep trying to do it their way. Many people keep trying to get to that place where their faith is based on what they can do. But it begins with a stick. No, with a tree. No with the cross. Pam, can you help me? I want to pray with the saints right now. I told you, if you missed it, it's done. How do you recover your faith? 
take responsibility for what you've done. Take responsibility for wandering away from God. Right now, somebody needs to take responsibility for wandering from God. Then, the next thing you need to do is remember. Stop being in denial of the life that you live. Stop being in denial of the things that you did. Accept responsibility and remember where it started. But if you can't remember, remember this. The cross is right where you left it. Then, take the remedy that God gives. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. How does me going on my knees and praying for forgiveness fix my relationships? How does me getting on my knees and asking God for mercy help my business? How does me going on my knees, 